I'm going to show you how to build up all of trigonometry without geometry. The study of trigonometry goes back to the Greeks, where Euclid's elements has all the necessary geometric elements to study what are called chords. And then 200 years later, Hipparchus gave us the first table of chords. Now, the study of trigonometry itself was continued by Madhava in India. We don't have any work from him directly, but a student of a student of his wrote a textbook containing Madhava's innovations, where we got our first taste of power series representations of sine and cosine, arctangent, and other functions. This was around 1400 AD and preceded Newton by a quarter of a millennium. And with Newton, we get differential equations. What we are going to do is work this precisely backwards. We are going to start with differential equations and get back to circles and triangles. We are going to define pi without any reference to a circle. There are a few rounds to trigonometry that you can find in the literature. Uh, Rudin uh, has a similar breakdown to what I'm doing here in his special functions chapter, and he cites two other papers. Rudin is very sparse about his citations, and annoyingly, this one time you put an inline citation, it's to the wrong paper. It took me an hour to track down the right manuscript, and you know I'll show you here, uh, but I, I digress. Let's go ahead and get into it. We start with a differential equation. y double prime is equal to minus y. We know that cosine satisfies this with y of zero is equal to one, and y prime of zero is equal to zero, and sine with the values swapped. What is handy is that if we start here and get the solutions to these initial value problems, then we immediately know they have to be precisely sine and cosine. And that is because Picard's theorem tells us that the solution to initial value problems of this form are unique. But since we don't have geometry, that won't be quite enough to satisfy us. We still need to define pi, figure out how we can show these are periodic from the definition, and show that the point cosine theta sine theta is on the unit circle. Solving the differential equation comes down to our first assumption about the solution, which is that the solution can be expressed as a power series. This gives y of t is equal to the sum a n times t to the n. And since we also need the second derivative, we have y double prime is equal to the sum of a n plus 2 times n plus 2 times n plus 1 times t to the n. Plugging this into the differential equation, we see that the sum of y with y double prime is 0. Hence, the coefficients of the sum are also zero. This gives the recursion a n plus two is equal to minus a n divided by n plus one times n plus two. Notice that since this skips over a n plus one, we get one recursion that starts with a naught and leads to all even index coefficients and another with a one and leads to all odd index coefficients. If we take a naught is equal to one and a one is equal to zero, then the power series becomes this and we call this cosine. Swapping those values give us what we call sine. Now, what we have shown is that any power series solution to the differential equation y double prime is equal to minus y can be written as a naught cosine of t plus a one sine of t, where cosine and sine are as we define them. Notice also that the derivative of our sine is our cosine, and the derivative of cosine is minus sine. Both follow from the power series representations. Next thing we're gonna do is show that the point cosine of t sine of t is actually on the unit circle. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to show that cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to 1. But at this point, we only know it's a function. So why don't we go ahead and see how we can show that this function actually has to be the constant function 1. Hey, so uh, these videos end up taking a lot of effort to put together. I think this one took like three weeks of uh, filming and editing and script writing and everything else like that. And if you like it, you know, please take a moment and just go ahead and hit that like button and share the video. And you know, if you want to see more of this stuff, please consider subscribing. I'd really like to see you come back. Uh, let's go ahead and get back into it. So we set h of t is equal to cosine squared of t plus sine squared of t. And let's take its derivative. The chain rule comes in here and we see that h prime of t is equal to minus two cosine of t times sine of t plus two sine of t times cosine of t, which, well, is zero. Hence, h of t is equal to a constant and we can find that constant by setting t is equal to zero. We know that cosine of zero is equal to one and sine of zero is equal to zero by our definition of the initial value problem in our power series. So that tells us that h of t itself must be one for all t, which means that cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one for all t. And so the point cosine of t comma sine of t is on the unit circle. So at this point, we're getting really close to being able to show the periodicity of sine and cosine. But first, before we can do that, we actually have to define pi because we don't have geometry. If we don't have geometry, we don't have circles. 
and without circles, we don't have circumference. The way we do this is we recognize that pi over 2 is the first positive root of cosine. So, why don't we go ahead and see if cosine has any roots at all? So, let's assume the opposite, and we will arrive at a contradiction. Let's assume that cosine has no positive roots, and since we know that cosine of 0 is equal to 1, cosine must be always positive. That means since cosine is the derivative of sine, that sine is a strictly increasing function. That means that sine is positive for all positive t. Now consider this integral, uh, the integral from x to y of sine of t dt from a fixed positive x to some arbitrary positive y. We know that this integral is bounded below by sine of x times y minus x, since sine of x is smaller than all the subsequent values. Sine is strictly increasing in this case. We also can integrate this exactly, since we know that the antiderivative of sine of t is minus cosine of t from our power series. So we end up with a difference of cosine values on the right. However, since cosine of t comma sine of t is always on the unit circle, cosine is bounded in magnitude everywhere by one. Thus, the difference between cosine values is bounded above by two. That term on the left, however, can get as big as we like. For large enough y, we can make that whole quantity exceed two, which is a contradiction because of that term on the right. And so, since this is a contradiction, our assumption must be wrong, and thus cosine must have zeros. Let's take the first one to be pi over 2. And note that since cosine squared of t plus sine squared of t is equal to 1, that means that sine of pi over 2 must be plus or minus 1. And since cosine is positive from 0 to pi over 2, this means that sine of pi over 2 must be 1 because it's increasing from 0 because cosine is its derivative. Now the next step is to show periodicity. And for that, we're going to need to show that e to the i t is equal to cosine of t plus i sine of t. This is going to be fun. We'll set y of t is equal to e to the i t. We can see that the first derivative gives us i times e to the i t, and the second derivative gives us i squared times e to the i t, which is negative 1 times e to the i t, or negative y. y here satisfies the differential equation we started with. y double prime is equal to minus y. And since the exponential function is representable through a power series, we get that e to the i t must be equal to a naught times cosine of t plus a1 times sine of t. Setting t equals 0 here gives a0 is equal to 1, and setting t equals 0 in the derivative gives a1 is equal to i. e to the i t is equal to cosine of t plus i sine of t. It follows that e to the i pi over 2 is equal to i, and if we take the fourth power of both sides, we get e to the 2 pi i is equal to 1. Consider e to the i times t plus 2 pi. That is equal to cosine of t plus 2 pi plus i times t plus 2 pi. Now this is also going to be equal to e to the i t times e to the 2 pi i. But that second term there is equal to 1. Cosine of t plus 2 pi plus i times sine of t plus 2 pi is equal to e to the i t, which itself is equal to cosine of t plus i sine of t. By the comparison of the real and imaginary terms here, we see that cosine of t plus 2 i is equal to cosine of t and ditto for sine. We get periodicity. We can also write cosine of t is equal to e to the i t plus e to the minus i t divided by 2, and sine of t is equal to e to the i t minus e to the minus i t divided by 2 i. And from this follows the sum of angle formulas. And ratios of sine and cosine give us the other trigonometric functions like tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant, etc. The rest of trig just follows from all of these. So that is trigonometry without any geometry. We just started with differential equations and worked our way backwards. And I really hope you enjoyed this video. It is something I've been putting together for a whole bunch of analysis videos to put up on my channel because, well, I'm working on you know teaching analysis at my own university. So please subscribe, uh, like the video, tell YouTube that you know, you know it's worth watching. And otherwise, I hope you have a great day.